Kiem hum gra, kiem hum gra, kiem huslianer ta er nergem gra, kiem hum gra. As many of you will know, for the last two years, like everybody else, we were confined to home and couldn't have the actual walk. We did have an online version, and we were delighted with the response to that. We had actually 2,000 people tuned in for the first online version in 2020. So that shows, I suppose, the impact and the interest that there is in this particular issue. We need to begin to find ways of remembering from below, and the most obvious, tangible and poignant example of that that I could find was the example of Tom Guerin, who was a three-year-old child in Skibbering whose body was found on the road and people assumed that he was dead, so he was thrown into a famine pit and his legs were broken to fit more bodies into the pit. And the action of having his legs broken made him start back to life and he was revived and he became known. He was disabled, obviously, by that process, but he was very famous in Cork and he moved around and known as the boy who survived... He was always very poor, he was always itinerant. And he's most famous to remember because he had to appeal to the workhouse for a pair of boots. And he wrote a poem as part of that appeal. And the last word of that poem is, I'll vanish into air. And I think that's a perfect metaphor for the voice of people who died. When you go back and do that analysis from below, from the perspective of Tom Guerin, I think you have to say that it wasn't an Irish famine at all. Of course, it was something that happened to Irish people, but it wasn't a famine. You know, and if you want proof of that, our destination today, Delphi Lodge, was somewhere that was shamefully full of food on the night when people died. So the notion that there wasn't food for people to eat is just a nonsense. So we have to repudiate that idea of it being a famine. The notion that famine is a lie has been said many times, not least on this walk. So if you reframe what happened from my perspective, something that has to be characterised as a British starvation, so it's British, it's a starvation, and from a contemporary perspective, I think we should regard it as a crime against humanity. It was something that happened in the context of the most powerful empire that had ever existed, that was capable of moving food and guns and people all around the world. So the strongest, richest empire that ever existed. And it also happened within the Union. So you know, uniquely, it happened within two structures that were incredibly powerful, rich, and capable of preventing starvation, and yet it happened. Since the 1980s in Afghanistan, the end of every war in Afghanistan has been only the beginning of another war. So I think that is something that really resonates with me. There is a need for love and compassion towards people who suffer from violence, from war, from poverty, from hunger. And I think Ireland has been very generous in terms of international reach and international support and I think we need to educate our generations and this kind of event this reminds us as adults that this has happened and this is happening at the moment in many many countries and this will happen in the future but the younger generation has stronger I think potential to stop such kind of hunger that is designed to bring suffering to a country. Look at Ukraine. It wasn't the wish and the will of Ukrainian people. And the impact of Ukraine war in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, everywhere. If there is a war in Ukraine, it doesn't mean that it is a war for Ukraine. It's going to impact everyone, socially, physically, financially, politically, in every sense. And Afghanistan, I mean, the war started now 45 years ago in the 1980s by Russia. And the same war continued, but with a different name. Mujahideen defeated Russia with the help of America. And the same Mujahideen did not disappear. They changed some of them, their names. They became the Taliban. And then the Taliban took the power. America came to defeat them. And then... They changed their name to Daesh and Al-Qaeda and, and all of that. And now they have the same power again when they got it 45 years ago. Afghanistan is an isolated country at the moment. It is landlocked, disconnected from international communities. 
There's no airports functioning at the moment. Girls are not allowed to go to school. Women are not allowed to go to work. And the same problem, the same situation in Iraq, in Syria, in Sudan, in Nigeria, in many, many other parts of the world. And I think Ireland as a country that is leading at international level in terms of impartiality, neutrality towards supporting people in need. I think Ireland has a bigger voice and a bigger power to play to stop some of these unnecessary wars, unnecessary hunger and violence. We all hear the statistics about a million dying, million emigrating, you know, that impact. The one that never leaves my mind is that during the period of the famine, 10.5 million pounds sterling, roughly, was spent on famine relief, which was late and inadequate, and eventually even discontinued. Huge amount of money in that time. In the same period, over 11 million sterling was spent on army and police. That's the kind of priorities that allowed and enforced a famine. And the gap is wider in today's world. We know huge multiples being spent on armaments vis-a-vis -vis trying to honour and preserve human life. I want to thank AFRI first. They will be on the ground, I think, almost 50 years and two or three years' time. It started in 1975, and this walk has been running just over 30 years. What they have done for me, and I hope for you as well, is that they have given us... I was going to, when I was thinking about this, they've given us a counter-narrative, and I thought, no, that's not what they have done. Counter is negative. It's too weak. What they have done is given us an alternative narrative, an alternative vision, and an alternative use of language in relation to what's happening in the world, particularly at this time, Duchme Inwelga Omne Kanuna. We've come to the point of no return, and to realise that the way that language is being used that there's a consensus mentality means we've learned absolutely nothing. We have simply learned nothing. And the title, Tejil Nahokaja and You, is Tackling Global Warning and Global Warring. And I think it's, I was going to say, a wonderful title. It's not. It's a very apt title because we cannot talk about one without the other because the two are fitche, fuche, lekele. They're completely integrated. And so when we look at global warming, the elephant in the room, of course, is the industrial military complex that's never brought into the discussion whatsoever. The real issues of climate change are not being tackled at all. The real polluters are not being tackled at all while we busy ourselves in the doll talking about side issues. I can think of no better person to quote than Ed Horgan, who was quoting Orwell. And he said in a recent article, we've now reached the point where war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And that really touched a chord with me, because we have come to that point where language doesn't mean anything anymore. And I'm obliged again to put on the record that the war in the Ukraine and the Russian invasion is absolutely unacceptable, illegal and horrific. Let me place that on the record. And why I do that each time, because we are constantly accused of siding with the Russians. Yes, I do, with the ordinary Russian people who are suffering and the few courageous, more than a few, who have dared to speak out and are now in prison. Do I side with the government of Russia? Absolutely not. But we have a duty to ask how was that allowed to happen while still condemning Putin and Russia out of hand? How did this happen? How has it happened that Sweden and Finland now believe they have no choice but to join NATO, which in my opinion has added to the danger of a third world war? The role of NATO must be examined, scrutinised for what it has done, and that hasn't happened. And so, when the president of the Ukraine was in the doll and made his speech, myself and my two colleagues were judged by the intensity and duration of our clapping, as opposed to anything we might have to say. So I got repeated phone calls from respected journalists, in inverted commas, that asked me, how long did I clap for, and why did I stop? And I asked them to come back and talk to me when they were ready to ask me about my opinion on neutrality and why I might feel so strongly about it. But no journalist has called me in relation to that. And so we have a focus on Ukraine, which is right. 
absolutely right to give all the humanitarian assistance we can give, but not at the cost of ignoring the war in Yemen, in Syria, in Afghanistan, and all of the other countries, Africa, Somalia. And we're doing that deliberately. And it's completely unacceptable to continue to do that. It is completely unacceptable to facilitate Ukrainian refugees, but not do the same for the asylum seekers that are technically, well, almost locked up in direct provision centres. And we have a duty to highlight that hypocrisy. Thank you. You give me hope and you give me the strength to continue, along with the other good colleagues that I have in the Dáil that unfortunately are in a minority. And I'll finish by saying, if we do nothing else, I hope today gives us the strength to focus on what's happening, to reject the narrative of warmongering in our name, because we have no choice, really, because we are at that point of no return.